Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can you all see this? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. All right. So um, thank you for that introduction. Uh, like, uh, like Rebecca said, I'm Zoelle. Very excited to be here calling in from Oakland, California. Um, and as she mentioned, I'm the head of marketing and growth at Block Party. Um, what that really means, because we are a very small company with only about three full-time employees for starting next week, uh, is that I really do everything related to our actual users, making sure that people who need these types of tools know that they exist, making sure that the people who are using the product are getting what they need from it, uh, and also trying to help change some of the conversation out there um, so that people understand that online harassment does not have to be the cost of doing business online. Uh, and you know, as Rebecca mentioned previously, I worked at a company called Airtable, which might seem a little bit like an odd switch from enterprise uh, SaaS products into uh, online safety. But it really comes down to a question that I've been obsessed with for all of my career and, and honestly, most of, of my sort of adult life, which is how can we give people more control over their digital experiences? You know, we live in a world today where we have increasing amounts of control over the physical goods that we might want to purchase. You can customize a couch, you can customize clothes. Um, and yet when it comes to our software, uh, too often we're ultimately sort of expected to take what's given to us by companies and not have any meaningful control over the products that we use uh, online. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, and I, I sort of like to joke that although um, this has been part of my, my professional career, really, I think I became obsessed with this way back in the day when I was an early user of Neopets, obsessively trying to customize, you know, how it's going to take care of, uh, of my Neopets. So from there to Airtable, where um, we were ostensibly helping people use spreadsheets better, but really letting them build their own software so they could have the tools they needed to do their work the way they wanted to. So now Block Party, we're trying to help people customize their social media experiences so they can set their own boundaries uh, and really have a safer experience that matches their needs. Uh, it's all about like, how do we give people more control? Um, that's why I'm here. So Block Party, for those of you who aren't familiar, makes consumer anti-harassment tools. Uh, we're, we're all about trying to keep you safe, uh, more specifically on Twitter. Uh, and just to give a little bit of context here, uh, I wanted to give the like 30 second version of our founding story, which is our, our CEO, Tracy, um, was one of the very first people to put out a call for companies in the tech industry to release their diversity data. So uh, she was one of the people out there uh, asking for more transparency around what the composition of teams in the tech industry looked like, helped to expose um, the, the sort of scope of the problem. I think many of us already knew there was an issue, but it really helped to make it concrete and start pushing for, for more concrete change as a result. Unfortunately, because of that activism that she did in the DEI space, she also became a target of tremendous amounts of online harassment. Um, and because she uh, had gotten so much out of being active on social media and helping to sort of spread the word about what she was doing. She didn't want to have to take a step back from those platforms. Um, instead, she thought, you know what, I'm an engineer. I worked at some of the social media platforms when they're very, very early days. I know how these works. I think we can make this better. And so she set out to create a tool that helped her initially and then many other people uh, to stay safe on Twitter and in the future, many other social media platforms as well. So really built from a place of lived experience uh, on behalf of our founder. Um, and, and as an aside, I'll just say that one of the reasons I came to the block party was because when I was working on uh, the vaccination effort back at the beginning of the pandemic, I got to see sort of firsthand how much harassment science educators and other people working in this space were experiencing online. So it was especially uh, acutely interested in trying to help bring these tools to people who were helping to move our democracy forward, helping to keep people safe. And we're unfortunately um, experiencing a lot of harassment as a result. So very quickly, Block Party gives people the power to cut out the toxicity of the online. Right now, uh, we only are on Twitter, though, again, hopefully that'll be changing soon. Uh, and we do things like give you essentially a spam folder for your mentions, allow you to proactively bulk block from a tweet, and then to actually bring members of your community into uh, get trusted help protecting you from trolls without having to actually like literally hand your device or your credentials to someone else. But this talk is not actually about our current product or Block Party specifically. This is all just context. Um, though you should know that uh, 
we do, I, I sort of highlight the fact that people really love the product, activists, journalists, et cetera, because it is a model for how third party companies or what uh, some academics would call middleware can actually really meaningfully change the experience that people have in these large public platforms. We've heard from members of marginalized communities and journalists that uh, tools like Block Party are the only way that they're able to continue being on Twitter at all. So all this is to say we've seen firsthand from our customers how much these types of tools can be really helpful. Um, and, and that's sort of the lens from which uh, we approach all the things that we're building. So all that context aside, here's what I want to talk to all of you about today. Um, this idea of creating safer digital spaces within popular platforms. Um, I'll start with a little bit of what's at stake, some of the really um, staggering numbers around the severity of the issue of online harassment. We'll take a little detour into the landscape of different interventions that could potentially make this better and unfortunately some of the structural barriers to trying to, to solve the issue. Uh, we'll dig deeper into online harassment and what that really means specifically where are some of the places that one can try and build tools to help make it better. And then at the end, if you'll all indulge me, I'll give you a sneak peek at uh, a problem that we are looking at next for Block Party. Uh, so with that, I'll jump right in. Okay. So let's start here. What's at stake? Why should we care about existing digital spaces? Fair warning, this might be a parade of like very depressing numbers. Sorry in advance. Uh, okay, so I, I'm sure no one here would argue with this question, but obviously online harassment, it's a real problem. It's not getting better. Um, I'm gonna be referencing a bunch of numbers from a, a study that the ADL did on online harassment in the United States in 2022. Um, that's just because it's the most recent study that has relatively large numbers. There are many other studies out there. Um, unfortunately, this is understudied in a global context. And so I, I'm gonna be giving you a U.S. numbers, but know that this is not just a U.S. problem. It is definitely a global problem, shows up in lots of different ways around the world. But we'll just start here. So um, according to this most recent study, 40% of Americans have experienced online harassment. It's even worse for youth uh, age 13 to 17, 47%. Um, these numbers are not getting better. If you look at the trends over time, they're staying the same or getting worse. Uh, and when you dig down even further, you can see that it disproportionately affects people in marginalized groups. So um, when we when we dig into people who have uh, sort of different cultural backgrounds, different religious backgrounds, et cetera, you can see some of these numbers get really, really high um, and not just any online harassment, but also what the ADL identifies as severe harassment. So things like doxing or swatting, um, sexual harassment, stalking, et cetera. Um, so very, very serious. It affects um, members of, of these marginalized groups even more. And the mental health impacts are really serious. I think, uh, you know, when I look at these results, um, this is for people who said they had experienced harassment, what the outcomes were. I think this is actually undercounting quite, quite substantially. So, um, you know, a minimum of 20% of people have trouble sleeping, concentrating, or feeling anxious as a result of the harassment. Um, very few people are reaching out to actually report harassment because in many cases, folks have not seen any actual change or outcomes from that harassment reporting. And so they're not taking the time to do it. It doesn't seem worth it. Um, and, and for a substantial portion of people here, you know, it does actually get to the point of depressive or suicidal thoughts. Um, so we know that the impact from a mental health perspective is serious. Um, and that not only that, it's affecting the stories we hear both on social media platforms from people who are choosing not to use their voices because they're afraid of harassment, but also in the media as well. So just to dive into the effect on journalists specifically, 76% um, of journalist harassment happens online. There are 40% of female journalists who actively report, like avoid reporting on certain types of stories because of their fear of online harassment. Um, and most of those incidents don't get reported. Uh, so you can imagine not only does it have impact on everyday people in, in very large numbers, but it, it also is affecting the landscape of media that we were able to hear about. It affects um, you know, who gets held to account because there is so much pressure um, from, from sort of the forces of, of online harassment. Uh, but as you all know, we can't just opt out. It's not like we can say like, great, well, we'll just all get off of, of Twitter and Facebook forever. And that's the end of that. Um, partially because the, the impact of the platforms is immense on both the good and the bad side, right? Like 
Uh, we know that it's been able to catalyze movements for political change. Many powerful institutions and people have been held to account as a result of folks being really brave and putting their stories out there on social media in spite of online harassment. Um, and the centralized platforms do have the benefit of, of reaching a very wide range of different people with these types of things. They also do help to build connection and community. And I, I decided to only show a few of the more positive examples here on the side just to make a, a brief break from the gloom. Um, but we've all also, in addition to, uh, you know, having bad experiences online, have seen that there are really these connections that it's able to build for folks as well. And uh, for many of us, social media use is a professional requirement, which means online harassment is a workplace safety issue. Um, and it, it's not really acceptable to say that it's just, you know, as, as I mentioned before, the cost of doing business online or something that you just have to put up with. It is genuinely something that uh, not only individuals, but employers have an obligation to protect their employees if they're requiring them to be active on social, which increasingly they are. Um, so I wanted to bring back uh, one last stat here from that ADL study. Um, which is in response to being harassed, almost a third of users stopped or reduced their use of platforms altogether. And when I think about the stakes of this type of work, this is really what sort of uh, what guts me outside of the individual impact. It's the fact that there are so many stories and voices that we will never hear from because people have uh, bad experiences and choose to opt out of the conversation altogether. Um, and particularly when we think about the fact that this type of harassment disproportionately affects marginalized communities, um, that means that those are the voices that are being silenced the most and all of us are losing out here. So what do we do about it? Uh, big question, of course. Um, I want to sort of contextualize how we think about uh, approaching solutions First, by talking about the landscape of interventions that are available, because I think, um, you know, sometimes when we have the conversation about solutions to online harassment, online abuse, the sort of harms of social media, we really only ever talk about two things. And I'm going to get out my like fake whiteboard here. So bear with my terrible handwriting. I'm so sorry, everyone. Um, usually we only talk about two things. We talk about regulation or we talk about platform responsibility. and uh, you know, setting aside the fact that uh, there are numerous issues around regulation and how it can be used for both good and bad, um, there's also the challenge that it's never really clear whose jurisdiction covers social media. Um, and so there's all sorts of mess around regulation. There's also the question of platform responsibility in the terms of service. Um, and we've all seen that that's clearly not sort of uh, fitting all of the needs of users today, or otherwise we wouldn't be having conversations like these. So although these two are both incredibly important pieces of the puzzle, they're not really sufficient. Um, but I'm gonna try and uh, persuade you today is that uh, there's room for a third set of solutions here, um, what you might call like third parties or middleware uh, that can help essentially to give users a voice in this conversation in a way that is gonna improve sort of safety for, for everyone and uh, make the ecosystem better. So in order to dig into that, I wanna use a specific example around uh, the idea of content moderation. So you can see here on the screen, I've got my little spectrum of online speech. Obviously there's lots of other speech in here. This is just examples. Um, but if you imagine trying to plot on a spectrum, there's the clearly bad stuff, and then there's some more clearly okay stuff on the internet. So on the clearly bad side, we have things that are explicitly illegal, right? Your revenge porn, threats, et cetera all the way down to like pictures of cats, which no one is likely to ever, uh, you know, say are not okay. And if we were to impose on this, the lines from the law and the platforms might look something like this. So um, at least in the United States, uh, the law line is sort of circumscribed by uh, the First Amendment, right? So there's a whole range of speech, uh, which people like to refer to as lawful but awful, um, which probably you don't want to see, but is never going to be against the law, at least in this country. In other countries, it's a little bit different. Um, because that line is so far to the left here on my spectrum, um, you're going to have a category of content that the platforms have already acknowledged is likely to drive people off of the platform altogether. And so they move their terms of service line a little bit further to the right over here. Um, 
But the reality, which I'm sure you all know, is that no one can actually agree on what content is good or not good or should be seen or not seen. Everyone has a different line. And so, you know, the terms of service might be here. Then there's the extremely opaque, um, like algorithmic boosting line, right, where the, the platform tries to guess what you might want to see or not want to see. Um, and, and maybe that sort of wiggles in here somewhere, though there's not a ton of transparency around that. You have no control over it yourself. Um, and there's no way that's going to match up with your line because everybody's preference line is going to look totally different. So you can imagine that for some people, they're totally okay with politics, but they don't want to ever see a spoiler for their favorite TV show. Um, and they never want to see medical imagery. Um, or maybe they're like me and they're okay with most of these things. But if you show them like fitness inspiration content, they're going to like throw their phone against the wall. Obviously, no one is taking your Fitspo away because I don't want to see it. Um, but that doesn't mean that I should have to see it, right? And today, I don't have that control. Um, obviously, that's a silly example. There's more serious examples here, too. Uh, nobody, you know, no one's going to make it against the terms of service to call me ugly. It doesn't mean, again, that I ever want to see that content. Um, and so because... Your preference is always going to be over here. It's very difficult for people to predict. They shouldn't be making those decisions on your, their, on your behalf necessarily. Um, and the platform is uh, incentivized to keep as much speech as possible without totally uh, pushing everyone off of the platform. There's always going to be this gap um, where you're going to end up getting exposed to things that you don't want to see unless you have a technological solution that can come in and help you to manage that for yourself. Um, and we like to think about this, obviously, in the frame of harassment, um, but like harassment takes place at the speed and scale of technology the same way that content moderation would have to. All of the solutions are going to need to operate on that level. Um, and what that means in practice is that in order to have third parties who can step in and do things like help you moderate the content that you see, whether that's mentions or things in your actual feed, we need to have open APIs uh, for middleware um, right now. I mentioned there were some structural barriers. Uh, the, the biggest technical one is that the only large platform that provides this type of API today is Twitter. And as you all may have heard, uh, it's not tremendously open anymore, or it won't be soon, given the new pricing that they are putting out. Um, the other platforms are not incentivized to build these APIs. Um, they mostly consider them a risk. Uh, because of the specter of things like Cambridge Analytica, um, and so are not willing to do the work to create a safe version of a type of open API that can enable a safety ecosystem on behalf of users. And unfortunately, what we've seen is that particularly in the current climate with layoffs and other things happening, social media platforms are focusing on putting their resources to building revenue, not to keeping their users safe. And so they're not going to build these APIs without some encouragement. Um, just a quick plug, if you are interested in helping uh, to fight for open APIs, please email me. My email is here. It's also at the end. This is something we're really actively working on. Um, we have lots of thoughts on how to do this in a really safe and thoughtful and privacy respecting way. We would love to get your thoughts too. I won't get into that in too much detail here, but just know that's something we're working on. We'd love to hear from you about something you're interested in as well. Um, all that is to say, there are some structural barriers. It doesn't mean it's impossible. Obviously, Block Party still exists. Um, and there are some other approaches like browser extensions, which we will talk about in a moment. But just know, in the landscape of interventions, there could be a third option of middleware if we make it possible. Uh, and otherwise, we have to get a little bit creative. So let's take a closer look at online harassment. Now, if we're, if we're trying to get into the like more positive, how can we actually intervene side of things, uh, we have to dig into um, online harassment itself and see where we might be able to make an impact. So um, first, just really quickly, what even counts? Um, no one actually agrees on this, which is very interesting. You'll talk to some people and they'll only count things that seem really severe. Uh, like doxing or swatting, uh, other folks uh, have a different opinion. So I like to think of this as falling into two main buckets, though as a caveat, I should say, if you are seeing something that you don't want to see online that someone is directing towards you, you shouldn't have to see it, regardless of whether someone is officially calling it harassment or not. We fundamentally believe you should be able to set your own boundaries. Um, but if you want to try and be a little bit more scientific about it, we think about two big buckets. There are high frequency but low severity types of harassment, 
Um, this is like, if you're looking at the example of Twitter, your reply guys, your concern trolling, any individual tweet of this type might not be like enough to necessarily ruin your day on its own, though perhaps it could. Everyone has different lines. Um, but when it happens at volume, if you have a thousand people who are sending you this sort of thing, it starts to chip away um, and have a really serious mental health impact, even if it is, you know, seemingly innocuous on a one on one sort of basis. And then there's also the low frequency, but very high severity uh, category of online harassment, your doxing, stalking, pylons, etc. But I want to make sure to just pause here and note both of these count. They are both very real. Even if you think, you know what, I'm never going to have a problem with stalking. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily make that assumption, unfortunately. But even if you think there's no chance that's ever going to happen, all of those other small things like concern trolling um, that you might experience, they still count and you still don't have to put up with them. The other question to ask is who are we trying to actually help with these interventions? And maybe it seems like the answer is obvious, right? Like people who are being harassed. But I want to make sure that we also think about this bigger category, not just to people who are being actively harassed right now, though there's lots of folks in that bucket, but also the larger group of people who are choosing to silence themselves because they have seen this happening out there and thus are opting out of having the conversation at all. And I'm sure it, even if you're not one of these people that you've potentially seen people um, who've made this decision themselves, who have powerful stories that they want to share, um, or like even just interesting insights from a professional's perspective or whatever else. And because they're so worried about the response that they're going to get, having seen what happened to other people online, they're choosing not to engage. Um, and so when we, at least at Block Party, think about the types of interventions that make sense, we want to make sure that there are tools for those people who maybe even haven't yet put a foot out into the water or toe out into the water to really feel safe engaging so that everybody uh, is, is willing to be part of the conversation so that we all we all get to benefit from, from that. So um, what I want to do here is talk about one approach to identifying places to intervene, which is thinking from the perspective of an attacker. This is something that if you have had more serious uh, harassment and have gone to sort of some of the uh, professionals, they'll often suggest that you do. It gives you a chance to um, feel a little bit more agency because you're able to sort of think a few steps ahead and take more proactive actions in order to protect yourself. Um, and it's also really useful when we're thinking about designing solutions. So. This is very simplified, obviously, like, please don't assume this is what everything looks like, but um, you can imagine that there are a number of different steps that happen before an attack occurs, right? There's like identifying who might be attacked, collecting personal information that you could weaponize, identifying um, potential vulnerabilities they might have, posts you might be able to take out of context um, or, or other like loved ones of theirs that you might be able to also target. Um, depending on the type of attack, there could be coordinating with others. Then there's the actual attack itself, of course. Then there's follow-ups as well. There's like monitoring the response from the person, follow-up attacks, et cetera. Um, and when we look at it this way, it becomes kind of clear that there's two big buckets that we can look at from an intervention perspective. There's more proactive ones. What can we do to preempt attack in the first place? And then there's sort of more reactive uh, actions we can take once attacks have started. So just to use the, the lens of block party here, for example, um, our current product, uh, we have this um, ability to monitor all of the mentions that you have. And if uh, something sort of doesn't fit your filter criteria, it goes into a spam folder, right? So this is like, if, if you're getting a harassing comment uh, at the moment that it occurs, we're going to intervene, we're going to take that out and put it somewhere else so you don't have to see it in your mentions, and you're not exposed to the harm. That's like right on the line here between proactive and reactive. We also have a tool um, called block lists, which allows you to uh, or basically be able to go and find a tweet that is pretend perhaps like sending harassment your way and be able to block anyone who liked or retweeted it, right? It allows you to identify people who um, are frankly more likely to also be sending you harassment or amplifying a harassing message. Um, so if that tweet has already gone out and you are blocking those people, you could consider that reactive, but we've also seen some people who choose to go out and find tweets that um, are aligned with worldviews that um, 
maybe are are dangerous to them. So if they're a member of the LGBTQ community and they see something that says something negative about trans people, they might choose to go and use that bulk block tool in order to block all the people who have liked or retweeted that preemptively um, so that their content is less likely to be exposed to those people and they're less likely to have a harassing action, right? And that would be a little bit more proactive. Um, <laughs> but there are all different ways that you can sort of uh, map this out. And so wanted to just quickly sort of map a little bit of what is currently on the market today and things that are, are helpful in the proactive and reactive categories to make this a little more concrete. So on the proactive side of things, we have things like moving personal data from search engines and data brokers. Um, this falls more in the category of stopping people from being able to uh, find personal details that they could weaponize in some way. There's deleting old posts. Um, which we, we know, unfortunately, can be um, contextualized inaccurately and cause waves of harassment. Um, there's a lot of education on best practices that are out there for steps that you can take, though those are typically like very long trainings and so on, very helpful, um, but that require sort of um, a lot of manual actions afterwards. And then there's some reactive tools as well. So uh, a few of the crumbs the platforms have given us around blocking and muting. Um, there's things like harassment filtering. We're not the only folks who do it. There's also a company called Bodyguard and a few others. Um, and then some around bulk blocking. I should note, there's a reason almost all of these are only for Twitter. Once again, it's about the APIs. There's only so much here. Um, so from here, I wanna dig into one particular part of that sort of uh, attacker model um, to talk about a problem that Block Party is thinking about and how we've sort of uh, engaged with this and then give you that demo. I know I'm, I'm getting up on time here, so I'll, I'll try and speed through a little bit. But uh, I want to talk about the problem of settings management. And I realize this might sound incredibly mundane, but it is very important. So we all know there are lots of social media platforms out there and more keep popping up all the time. Um, and frankly, you know, it sounds a little bit silly, but managing your settings on social media is actually really hard. Uh, they intentionally make it very confusing. Um, it's time consuming. It's manual. It's not always clear what a setting is going to do for you. Um, the available information is often out of date. It can be hard to understand or understand what the trade-offs are going to be for people who do need to be more active publicly, but also want to keep themselves safe. And frankly, it takes a lot of friction. So, um, you know, I've spoken with newsrooms uh, around the world that have their journalists go through hour, hour and a half long trainings to figure out exactly which settings to lock down. Um, not everybody is actually taking those steps until it's too late, unfortunately, because there's so much friction in the process. So. Um, the consequences, unfortunately, are really severe if you don't do these things. Um, it increases the risk of impersonation, phishing, and doxing attacks. And I should say, like, this is not just for people who are super high profile, right? Like, there are reasons why an attacker might want to uh, take over your Twitter account in order to use it as a sock puppet, for example, or they might want to fish you at work, even if you aren't a publicly prominent person. Um, the, the risks are unfortunately there for everybody. Um, there's also uh, a lot of these things that come up in a really global context as well. Um, one example that's really heartbreaking that I kept hearing over and over again as we talked to newsrooms about this problem is um, personal photos being used with generative AI to create um, sexually abusive images of people. Uh, this is something that's happening a lot in the, the global context. It hasn't happened quite as much in the United States, but it certainly does in India and other countries. Um, but unfortunately, the frontier of how people misuse your personal data just keeps growing. Um, and so although it seems mundane, getting those settings under control is really, really important. And it allows us to be proactive before something bad happens. So uh, we asked ourselves, what if we made it easy to manage this, made sure that we had the actual expert recommendations, um, made it happen in your browser step by step so you understand what the trade-offs actually are, um, automate what we can in a way that is still respecting your agency and making sure you're making the decisions, but saving you the time so that you're more likely to actually do it. Um, and also, uh, keeping everything private and making sure that we're not, you know, collecting information that we shouldn't be. And the result is privacy party. And so I'm going to jump into the demo if that's all right. Okay. And bear with me, everyone. This is Figma because live demos with browser extensions are scary. Um, okay. 
Cool. So uh, like I sort of alluded to earlier, there's two options when you're building middleware, right? You have APIs or you can go through a browser extension because we are unwilling to wait until the larger platforms open up their APIs. We built an extension. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and walk you through it here. So you can imagine uh, we would open up the browser extension here. It's um, currently called Privacy Party. We'll see if that sticks. Hopefully you all like it. Um, and you're going to be introduced to a whole bunch of different playbooks that you could follow to help stay safe. Um, so we can take a look. This is just a sample set of platforms that you might want to lock down. There's a whole lot more, um, but these are the ones that we're starting with. If you open it up, what it'll do is uh, open this little side panel next to the platform that you're planning to engage with. And because this is a browser extension, it's happening in your browser. It's not phoning home to us. We're not going to keep any of your login information. It's happening right here. Um, we're just going to help take some of those actions on your behalf to save you some time. So uh, each, uh, each of these is going to have a, a number of suggestions. These are just samples. This is unfortunately not as many actions as you have to take on Facebook. I think the list is something like 12 to 15. Um, but for the sake of this demo, just going to show you three. Um, so for each of these, you'll be able to see where we're making the recommendation um, and why you'd actually want to take that. So in this case, let's say, you know, we want to keep your personal information private. We're going to give you a sense of some of the attacks that, um, you know, this information could be used to create. Um, and if you want to get more information on the specific risks, you can dig in here. We'll also be including information on what the trade-offs actually look like. So if this is going to reduce your reach, for instance, if you're, you know, trying to um, spread the word about a particular story that you have or whatever else, or from a professional perspective, you need to think about reach. We'll make sure that that's included here. Um, we just want to make sure that people really have the context that they need. And then we'll give you a series of specific actions we can take on your behalf uh, if you want to. Um, and we'll show you what your current setting is here so you don't have to go digging for it. But um, if we have a recommendation that is more locked down, you'll be able to go in and choose if you do or don't want to. So let's say my birthday is, you know, out there a lot. I'm a public figure. It's, it, the cat's already out of the bag. I don't have to change that necessarily. I can always opt out. Um, and for many of these, you can always undo them later, and we're going to make that really easy for you. But you'll just be able to go ahead and hit update for me. They'll take place in the browser right there. You'll be able to see exactly what happened. And then, like I mentioned, if you do want to undo, you can. As you're going through, if you wanted to see where this was occurring, you can always click to see the specific pages. Um, as a fair warning, unfortunately, sometimes these are not always super clear, but we want to make sure that you can at least go find them for yourself. Um, all of this is about really uh, trying to make sure that users have as much agency as possible. Um, and to that end, if you go through and you're like, you know what, I actually don't care about the posts that I've been tagged in, not our recommendation, not the recommendations of the expert, uh, you know, that we have pulled these recommendations from, but fine, if that's not right for you, you can always go ahead and skip any section. So you can move through this pretty quickly if you want to. Um, and then you'll be able to uh, sort of choose which ones you want to engage with. This last one I wanted to make sure we included just because um, this is where you're going to save a ton of time and where we've often seen people like decide to come back later and never come back. If you think about um, at least people in my age cohort who came up with Facebook, um, you probably have a whole lot of photo albums out there that you don't realize everyone can see, um, or at least I do. I shouldn't say that for any of you. Um, but what you'll be able to do is actually choose the specific settings that you want for uh, photo albums here. And instead of having to go through one at a time, because right now on something like Facebook, you can't set this as a global setting. You do have to go through every single one individually. Same thing for cover photos. Really scary. Um, you will be able to opt in to change those um and we'll be able to update and we'll let you know like in this case this isn't something we can easily undo for you so you make that decision really intentionally we make sure it's an opt-in not an opt-out we don't want to like trick anyone into messing up their facebook settings or whatever um but if you do want to take that step you'll be able to go ahead and hit update and instead of taking literally i did this more than an hour to change every single photo in your facebook photos it'll take us you know uh just a few seconds to take care of that for you so 
like I said, this is not all the recommendations by any stretch of the imagination. We've pulled from um, a wide range of recommendations uh, from experts like the security team at Yahoo News um, to uh, the New York Times, a bunch of other like incredible organizations working on safety for some of the most um, targeted people out there. Uh, but this is just sort of the examples. Once you actually get through all of them, you'd be able to stop showing it on Facebook so you don't have to see that sidebar forever. <laughs> Um, and if you did want to come back and take a look at this later, you'll always be able to see exactly what settings you affected. Um, if you have multiple accounts, you can always log into different ones and you can get back and see those new playbooks later. So it's pretty straightforward, but we think it has the opportunity to have uh, a large impact um, just for people who who haven't been willing or haven't had the time or the ability to go in and, and take these actions so that they're less exposed to that wide range of different potential attacks and they have a better understanding of how they're showing up online and they have the decision to sort of do that for themselves. Uh, that's my little demo. Um, I just want to close quickly by saying this. If you are interested in um, getting involved, we would love your feedback where, uh, hopefully either here during the Q&A or um, we also have a wait list now available for this product. If you want to go play it out uh, yourself once it's out there, uh, we would love to hear from you. Um, I also mentioned this before, but we're working on legislation to safely open up APIs for safety middleware. If that is interesting to you or your thoughts on this, please, please get in touch. I would love to hear from you. Um, and I hope you noticed as I went through all of this somewhat quickly, there's a lot of areas that still don't have tools for consumers at all. There are so many solutions waiting to be built. Block Party is definitely not going to build them all. And frankly, we wouldn't want to. There are so many communities that you need unique solutions for themselves uh, that are going to be like thoughtfully created for the needs of that community. If you have the interest and the ability to do it, consider getting involved in this area. There's a huge gap here. Uh, and while there are definitely structural issues, it's not impossible. If we can be helpful to you in that, please let us know. Um, and of course, we're we're hiring too. So if you if you want to come help us work on it, uh, we've got open roles, and we would love to hear from you there too. That's that.